Um, my name's Andy, co-founder, CEO at Automat. I am not going to talk a lot about Automat. Um, ben and I were talking about, hey, what would be interesting? My team and I have spent uh, 16 years now working on conversational technology. Um, not all at Automat. Automat's about nine months old. And so we thought it'd be kind of cool to sort of take a history lesson and kind of look at one path that got us to where we are today and see if there's any interesting lessons that come out about that. Um, I'll talk a little bit about Automat at the end. Um, so this is, this should just be called I'm old, but it's uh, stuff that I learned doing speech recognition, natural language, voice assistance, mobile voice assistance, and then the last nine months at Automat. So this is kind of like the agenda slide, um, which is we're going to start off by talking about phone-based voice recognition. People call it interactive voice response and sort of talk about why that was actually important in getting us here. Um, I'm not going to talk about Active Buddy or Smarter Child. Uh, Robert's in the back and his uh, partner Peter are going to be here later to talk about that, but it's important to note that that happened sort of in the middle. And then, we, of course, mobile voice assistants. You guys all know Siri, et cetera. I worked on a bunch of enterprise ones. And then tackle this question kind of head on around, do we need AI? That's come up a whole bunch of times. Um, I have a pretty specific point of view on that. So um, I'm going to take you back in time to the year 2000. I'm super proud of my awesome rotoscoping technique because this is today's date. So we go back to the year 2000, and there's this company that I work for, Nuance. Um, how many of you guys know Nuance? Nuance would be happy. Uh, it was great. I, this was my training ground. I learned everything I know working there. Awesome company. Around 2000, they did their IPO, which is when I joined. And what I want to sort of talk about is this kind of provenance idea of voice assistance, because I, I don't think many people know this. I just think it's kind of interesting. There's no real point to it except to say um, this is one of the paths that led us to where we were. So in between 2000 and sort of 2007, there was a lot of big brands hopping on voice IVR and doing customer service through that. I'm not really going to talk about that. But what I do think is kind of interesting in the pathway to bots is that in 2007, Google launched Goog 411. This was like a directory assistance thing, like anybody remember 411? And they did that to bootstrap their language models, which ultimately led to Google Now and now Google Assist. It's highly unlikely that a lot of these, uh, the code and stuff is still in these products today, but definitely the skill set, the employees, all that kind of stuff is definitely part of it. Siri, well documented that the Siri application used Nuance uh, prior to acquisition. Afterwards, we don't really know, but uh, clearly a pretty straight arrow there as well. Then we get into this company called Tell Me. Tell Me was uh, started in 99. Nuance was started roughly 2005, 2006. And they actually got acquired where, at the time, was the biggest acquisition, I believe, that Microsoft had ever done. And of course, that leads to this. And then there's this thing I worked on called Nina. We'll talk a little bit about that, which was the first enterprise Siri sort of voice assistant. And then Echo and M, I think, deserve to be up there, but don't really fit into this kind of provenance chart quite so clearly. So I just thought that was kind of cool, and it was super fun to be part of all that and watching all that happen. And it kind of leads us up to this bot step. Um, but before we go there, um, I'm going to talk about this sort of apocryphal story in the voice space and that happened in the mid-2000s. Uh, there was a big, and this is about IVR, right? So I'm going to do IVR and then we're going to do lessons from IVR and then mobile voice assistance and some lessons there. And so I'm going to play an audio clip. I'm really sorry to subject you to an IVR audio clip before noon. Um, I want you to listen to it. This was actually played for a group of executives at UPS. They were doing a big, you know, we want to do one voice, one brand uh, kind of strategy and said like, okay, how do we make this IVR really uh, tell our brand values. And so this was the clip that was played for them of their current IVR system. You guys are all the executives at UPS. Uh, listen to it carefully. Thank you for calling UPS. Please visit us on the web at ups.com for all UPS service information or select from the following seven options. To track a package using your tracking number, say or press one. To schedule a UPS pickup or to receive rate information, press 2. For international shipping, say or press 3. For UPS package time and transit information, press 4. To find package drop-off locations, say or press 5. If you received a yellow info notice, press 6. To order FedEx Express supplies using your FedEx account number, say or press 7. To hear these options again, press the star key. Sorry about that. Um, I've never seen so many people in a talk plug their ears at one moment. Um, so yell it out if you heard anything. 
Anybody notice anything just really off there besides the fact that it was horrible but really off? Okay, so that's good. When this happened in the room, nobody saw it. And in fact, it's a little bit even more than you probably heard. The last one mentioned FedEx, but what it was is every menu item was spliced UPS is IVR, then FedEx is IVR, and nobody in the room could tell the difference, right? So I've been looking to get this GIF into a talk for a long time, but this was basically the reaction of all the executives in the room. Total, utter, abject horror, because their brand was indistinguishable from their competitors. So a few lessons coming out of this, um, and a lot of this is gonna be obvious, I think, but it's, it was actually fun for me to go back and think about this. I don't think about this stuff day to day. Brand matters, and we have new, techniques now, right? Co companies care about their brand a ton. In that world, we only had voice to capture the brand. Now we have conversational UI, but we also have the GUI side of it. This actually means that all of us in this space need to be really, really good at brand. The other thing I want to be super clear about, people have talked about persona. It's a really important thing in this space, but brand is not persona, right? If you're going into a company, you're like, let me build this cute, cool, cute chatbot. Dealing with marketing teams and brand teams and PR teams at companies is a whole different skill set. If you don't know about that, you need to partner or think about how to get those skills. Um, second thing is pithiness, you know, not being too verbose. Um, this is kind of obvious too, but you need to guide people, not inundate them. That's super obvious in voice, but I see a lot of bots that start dropping walls of text and they put a two second delay between it and they think that that's okay. It's not okay. And the reason it's not okay is you think that you're giving people guidance and you're like, if I tell them everything, they'll do the right thing and they'll stay on track, but they won't. They'll actually ignore it. You'll have exactly the opposite thing happen. They'll ignore your instructions. They'll do whatever they want. And now you really have a hard problem getting them back on track. Um, Another thing, so this button, so you heard press or speak. Um, that's an old pattern. It does work. Um, this is probably where some of us start to diverge. I think this idea of buttons plus natural language is actually going to be the enduring pattern of messaging. And so this sort of search plus browse metaphor, right? So if we take this idea, so Yahoo has search, but back then it didn't work. It was really about saying humans are awesome at visually scanning information, right? That's why you want to have some sort of GUI sort of information density. But who wants to live in a world where you have to burrow down? When we started doing this for com customers, we'd get in a room, we'd do demos, and we'd use all the cool you know, calls to action and buttons, and we'd burrow down. And most of the time, the reaction was like, this sucks. Like, I don't want to burrow down on a bunch of menus. And so using a natural language input, the equivalent of search here, think about how we use the web. We go, we search, we get close to where we want, then we go burrow. I think the pattern is gonna be the same on messaging. It needs to be the same on messaging. Suggested replies, all that stuff is awesome, but um, it's way less rich from a UI perspective than what we even have today on the web. So a few other lessons. Um, off script is the norm, right? People are gonna type, right? Ted has talked about, you know, from Kick in the current Kick uh, application people don't type, they use suggested replies, but it's really, really hard to get onto a type cycle in that particular application. Even in Messenger, um, there's a lot of, the current design of the messaging applications really promotes the use of suggested replies. What if we actually had techniques that made it easier to mix and match those two things? I don't know about you guys, but in the data that we see, people do type. At a bare minimum, they're gonna try and break the bot. And so being able to handle that is pretty, pretty important. Um, doing what's called sort of out of domain uh, is, is what we would sort of call that. Um, routing, so routing is this term that was often used in IVR, and it was the idea of a natural language, how may I help you type prompt at the top that would then jump over a bunch of menus, get you in the proximity of what you were gonna do, and then from that point on, you might do some, in voice, you still had to do voice, but in messaging, we can potentially do a natural language input, get people in the proximity of where they wanna go, and then start using suggested replies, GUIs, cards, et cetera. Um, this CLU, I use the term conversational language understanding, it's really not meant to be a marketing term. I think NLU, natural language understanding, has really been very one-shot. Let me say one thing, understand it, extract intense entities, and then handle that. It's been really, really bad at doing a full thread of conversation. People talk about context, we'll get into that in a little bit. Um, another one that might not be super obvious, error handling, don't do it. You, uh, the, it seems like it's something you should do, right? Let me have multi-level error handling. Let me try and get people on track. Let me understand what they're doing and help them out. It doesn't work. The data is like completely conclusive on this. Um, if you fail one time, have some exit strategy. If you have humans escalate to them, it's not gonna help you to try and keep them on track. People get frustrated. We've known this for years in voice user interface design. Um, there's no reason that's any different in messaging. 
So uh, some of these things sound like, I mean, that the, uh, the UPS thing was customer service. At Automat, we're not doing customer service. Um, there's a lot of folks who are going into customer service. This is kind of like my PSA. Um, I don't want you to screw it up for the rest of us if you're going into customer service. Um, there's a lot of folks saying, well, there's a sale there, and I, nobody wants to make phone calls. Unless you can actually do better than what I'm about to show you, you shouldn't do customer service. You might get a few deals, but you're going to get smoked after that. Um, so this is the perfect IVR. That's it. 100% containment, 100% deflection, maximum cost savings for the company that deployed that IVR. That's how it works. And so if you're building a bot today, that's what you're actually trying to do unless you're able to build technology that is better than the state of the art about understanding, responding, and handling uh, the things that people want to do. So simply just putting in a little bit of natural language, having a few people use it, and then just go, this sucks, and not use it, you can have a successful business for a small amount of time, um, but you should be able to answer the question about how you're going to do better. And there is technology and techniques out there that will allow you to do better, but if you're pulling off-the-shelf stuff, TensorFlow, NLTK, all this stuff, you're not inventing stuff, you're not going to do better than this. Um, a couple things. I, these are sort of books on my bookshelf. They've been there forever. They're kind of seminal works in the space of voice user interface. If you can find them, pick them up. They're actually, there's a lot of things that are uh, completely wrong about them in retrospect. The book on the left, it's, good to be, uh, it's better to be a good machine than a bad person, almost uses an Alexa-like example and says this will never work, uh, which ends up being wrong. But there's a lot of good lessons in there. Um, this book is coming out very soon. My friend Kathy Pearl, also ex Nuance, uh, still working in this space, is delivering this book on voice user interfaces. It's coming out soon. She tells me there's going to be a lot of good stuff in there for messaging as well. So let's move on now. It's kind of IVR uh, into the world of mobile voice assistants, Siri, et cetera. Um, I'm going to show you guys a commercial that probably a bunch of you have seen. This is probably the, the mobile voice assistant that's best known that my team worked on while we were at Nuance. I'm showing it to you. I'm going to show you guys a couple of demos um, from that world uh, pre-automat just to, so we can use them as a jumping off point for some lessons as well. So the first one is uh, Domino's. Cancel my morning meetings. How about a meeting with pizza? Where is Orion's belt? Light years from pizza. Dom, how do I do karate? I don't know karate, but I know pizza. Jiu-jitsu? Yeah. Introducing voice ordering on the Domino's app. Dom, I'm going to need a pizza. I thought you'd never ask. OK, Dom. Let's order the usual. I'm on it. So the thing that I thought was cool about that, that was a fun one to work on. I think they did a great job. It's still live in the app store. You can pull it down. Is it really anticipated bots in a really interesting way. And I think the in interesting way is that they were the first ones to sort of say, hey, this voice assistant in my app for pizza is not a generalist, right? That's the whole joke of the commercial. It can't help me with jujitsu. It can't help me with all this other stuff. It only knows pizza. And I think that's a lot like what we're actually seeing happen with bots. So I don't actually consider any of these generalist voice assistants to be bots. Some people use the term. I think we invented a new term. There's something new happening. It's very tied to messaging. Um, so for me, bots are sort of the experts. And I do anticipate, this is not a new idea, I really do anticipate that these top-level voice assistants are going to help solve the discovery problem, right? Uh, Microsoft has actually been pretty vocal about sort of the idea of Cortana as a top-level voice assistant keying into bots. I think you're going to see that happen over time. Uh, I don't think bot shops and bot stores are going to be, you know, a viable long-term way to discover bots. I think this uh, will be a much better one. Um, okay, now I'm going to show you another video. It's a banking, it's interesting to come after Abe a little bit. It's a banking uh, demo. This actually was August 2012 when we launched Nina. Uh, again, I'm showing it to you to show you, A, what the state of the art was five years ago uh, when we built it, four years ago when we launched it, just because I see a lot of people talking about concepts that are actually multiple years old as new things and saying, hey, it's going to solve it. It's not going to solve uh, some of these problems. And then we're going to use that as a jumping off point for, for lessons in mobile. So uh, here's a minute and a half or so long demo. Find the nearest ATM. Here are the closest ATMs.
You'll need to call about that. Here's how. How much did I spend last month? You spent $424 last month. Show me just the transactions over $50. Here are the transactions over $50 from last month. How about in March? Here are the transactions over $50 from March. Pay the statement balance on my Comcast bill from my savings account for next Friday. I will pay $150 from your savings tomorrow, okay? Yes. So that's blast for the past for me. Um, if you are thinking of doing a voice assistant, you should absolutely talk to Nuance. They're the world's best at that. All this technology, they've continued to improve over the years. So that's not what we do at Automat. I just thought it was a good uh, explanation, jumping off point for lessons. You see a lot of stuff that people talk about in there, right? So for example, uh, at one point, it was kind of interesting to go back and do this presentation. There's that swipe up set of what we called hints. They really kind of anticipate suggested replies. Um, and those worked. When we did tests with people, we saw that people would find that and they'd go, oh, this is so cool. And they thought that was what the whole app was, right? So I think suggested replies are legit. They're real. People do want to use them. But if they're not there, then people die. So like Ted sort of talked yesterday about a blinking cursor is death. I think that's probably true. But having a set of suggested replies and not seeing what you want is also death. So I you know I'm kind of harping on this point, but I think it's an important one that you really do need sort of both uh, capabilities. Um, the second, context, right? So you heard me do the demo. It's like the canonical Siri 4S launch. What's the weather like in San Francisco? How about Napa, right? I said, how about transactions over $50? How about in March, whatever? Um, that stuff is mostly, in virtually every system, just glorified variables with some if-then-else statements, right? So that's not context, that's not language, that's not hum how humans process stuff. Uh, I think David Marcus was the guy that sort of said threads are the new apps. If you can't at least manage the context of your entire thread and understand everything that's happened there and use that in a way that human beings, human beings when we have conversations, there's a, you know, an idea of theory of mind, which is we can model each other's thought processes. Context is really about saying, hey, I've told my bot this in the past. I should have some reasonable expectation that it's going to know what I'm talking about if I use regular human language. That's a really hard problem. If all you're doing is some sort of variable store and code, uh, you're not solving that. The other thing is we found nobody does how about Napa. It's a cool tech demo. It doesn't actually happen in the wild. Um, so context is not how about. Um, lastly, this inertia question, right? So in, on Domino's, um, you could actually order pizzas over 50% faster than you could using the touch screen. Turns out that the inertia of using the existing application beat all that convenience. Um, I think there's a lot of us that are going down this path right now of saying, hey, let's build a bot for a use case that already exists. I think the whole point here is, and Ted has also said this repeatedly, um, we need to find different use cases, not just better use cases. You're going to find that the inertia of the existing system is going to trump your innovation if you're not finding a new use case, something that a person couldn't do before. A few more lessons. Uh, multimodal. I think this is one of the biggest deals, right? So we were just talking about this in the back. Uh, this has never happened before. Voice communications, either IVR or mobile voice assistance, even things like Alexa that are modern and new are completely temporal only. Conversations move forward in a straight line. They don't tend to, you can go off track, but they're always moving forward. You don't go back. You have no spatial awareness. In messaging, it's the first time, because it really is messaging where this comes together, that for the first time you have a spatial awareness in the cards, in the suggested replies, in the UI elements, which are getting richer every day, and you've got the ability to mix that with a temporal conversation flow that's going forward. That's a huge deal. Most of the design patterns for this have not yet been invented. A lot of folks are focusing on just the language aspect to it. That actually misses the point of messaging, I think, a lot, because you're, you're turning it into a forward driven conversation, which was always a hard problem. People get lost in these conversation threads, uh, but with the ability to intermix UI and conversation, uh, I think that's where really the biggest uh, innovations are going to come from. 
Uh, mobile voice assistants, this is the main reason you don't see them everywhere. Brands were excited about this. What kind of brand wouldn't want to have a Siri in their application? They, most of them have applications, right? The reason that they're not there is because they were too expensive and too hard to build. So bots have to be self-service. If you're out there and you're building technology and the technology requires a ton of documentation to be distributed to a customer, or you need to go have professional services, sit downs with them, teach them how to do it. If they have to have PhDs on staff to build machine learning models and natural language, then we won't have an industry and talk about will not exist for a couple more years, or in a couple more years, because we'll, we'll have the same fate as mobile voice assistants. This stuff needs to be easy, and uh, my take on this is that the AI aspect of this is what needs to make it easy. Right now, everybody's building AI that is really fucking hard for people to use. The whole point of AI is that it's supposed to learn and get smarter and actually make it so that if you're a business person, a marketer, a creative, you don't have to have a PhD. Um, I see a lot of tools out there, tree view builders, data labeling uh, interfaces. These are all fails. These are basically us giving machine learning tools to creatives and business people. That's never going to work. So I think this is pretty obvious at this point. This is sort of how we define a bot, not particularly new, but I think some people think bots are more than this. It's the messaging app component and it's AI. It's not just AI. Uh, it's, you know, you need to be really good at letting them build the application component, but you also need to be really good at letting them build the AI component, again, to interleave the spatial and temporal, the GUI, and the conversational. So I don't know how many of the platform folks are in the room, but because there was going to be a few folks, I wanted to make sort of a public wish list. Um, there's 50 things we want, but I want to get into just a few. The first is that bots should initiate. I can't believe we haven't solved this yet. Um, Bots all give you some kind of getting started uh, the first time you use them, and then you go back in and you have to type hi. It's nuts. People go into the bot, into the thread for a reason, and if they open it and you can actually have some context about why they may have come back in, you can say hi, here's how I can help you at this point when you've come back in. Bots need to be able to initiate the conversation. This is an old, old, old dialogue idea called mixed initiative. The idea where a person can initiate the conversation, the system can initiate the conversation, and over time you can actually mix the initiative, that's a problem that you need to be solving. At the end of the day, it's just the bot needs to be able to say hi. Um, second thing I really want, and I think this is where, when we talk about interleaving conversational interface with suggested replies and UI, right now people, if they're not typing, are not typing because it's really not obvious that you can type. And so I think there's a lot of innovation to happen in that little line, both on Kick and Messenger, for example, it says, type a message. That's all it says. It's this gray text that everyone's going to ignore. If we could highlight that text, if we could programmatically control that text, if we could draw attention to the text bar at moments when it made sense that you might want to type because maybe you hadn't tapped a suggested reply or you didn't see a suggested reply that made sense, I think we'd actually get people mixing and matching the temporal and spatial, the conversational, and the GUI uh, much, much more. So I want to see some the, the, the platform companies innovating there and giving us things to experiment with. Uh, last one is a no-brainer, platform parity. Um, I don't know how to say this any more strongly. All of the things we've seen, suggested replies below the fold in the keyboard, Messenger should have that. Suggested replies above the fold, which give you sort of nice menu options, Kick should have that. Slack needs carousels. All of these things make sense. None of the platform companies are going to win because of one small UI innovation. The faster they give us bot developers uh, access to the single set of UI primitives, uh, we'll be able to innovate on use cases, not on platform translation. The one area that I do think this is different a little bit is the stuff that Tom was talking about yesterday with respect to enterprise translation. When you're talking about 30 different platforms, it's a different problem. On the consumer space, we're talking about uh, a much smaller set. So I haven't talked about Automat too much, um, insider industry conver you know, conversation. If you're a customer, um, be happy to show you a demo and show you what we're doing uh, after this. But a few things that'll give you some insight. So after all of this, you know, sort of talking about what we, what we think, um, this is what we think and believe at Automat. We think tools and frameworks are for creatives, uh, business users and developers, and the collaboration is key. Most of the stuff that out there is out there right now is some kind of weird tree view builder thing that's kind of okay for a developer doesn't really serve the needs of a business user and absolutely doesn't serve the needs of a creative and doesn't really help work through the actual business process of building, sign off, review, all that stuff with customers. Um, in terms of platforms, um, we think the platforms are really different, right? What you're going to build on Kick is super different than what you're going to build on Messenger and obviously way different than what you're going to build on Slack. 
And we think you should be able to build first class experiences for each one of those, not have sort of a lowest common denominator translation into those. Um, so how do you build for all platforms, but how do you build for all platforms, making sure that you get the best experience for the right demographic on those platforms. Building for a 15-year-old on Kick is very, very different from building a business bot. Um, thirdly, conversational language understanding. Talked about this, we think that AI should be invisible. We think that AI should make life easier for people who are building these bots. And we absolutely think that if um, you're not doing AI, then we're really missing out. AI is the most important technology transformation in the last 20 years. It's gonna change everything about our society. And if bot builders are like, nah, we just need suggested replies, then we are recusing ourselves from that important transformation. Bots are not as important as AI. Bots are the delivery vehicle for AI. And if we don't take that as an industry and make, make that true, then we're gonna be you know, uh, kind of a side joke, I think, in, in that whole space. So we're thinking a lot about how do you make AI um, not be effort in quality out, effort in intelligence out, but make the AI work for the end user and developer. And then lastly, and we haven't really talked about this at all, messaging is really about humans too, right? This is, we're not gonna all be talking to bots. We're gonna talk to humans as much as we talk to bots, if not more. And the trick here is, if we think about IVR, if we think about mobile voice assistants, dropping back to a human being out of those platforms is there's a huge amount of friction. Whereas if what you're doing in messaging, interleaving conversations between humans and bots is super, super easy, super friction free. And a lot of people are talking about human in the loop and learning. If you're a customer and you're out there and someone's saying to you, hey, we do human in the loop and we do learning, ask them how they're doing it. Come ask me how we're doing it because you want to have a really specific answer. What most people mean is we've got a human in there, we're logging data, you can go look at the logs, then you can label the data, and then you'll have a smarter system. It's effort in, quality out. That's not going to lead to a spot where these uh, bots are cheaper than mobile voice assistants and where they're everywhere. Uh, you're gonna have a very small number of them. So, last slide. Um, at Automat, a couple things about us. Uh, we are working with customers today. We're pretty quiet. Um, it's kind of a joke with those of us in the room, I think. We don't talk a lot about what we're doing. We do talk to customers. Um, we're gonna have a major brand launch in October uh, that's pretty exciting. Um, uh, we'll let you guys know when that comes out. And uh, we're gonna be in private beta later this year. So all those things, if those features are interesting to you, if that sort of vision is interesting to you, if you're a customer and you're looking to build a bot, come find me, I'll show you a demo, and uh, we'd be happy to talk. Couple quick questions. We have time for a couple quick ones. I know. Give me a break. That was amazing. He's not mincing words. Hi. Um, since you're familiar with how to be um, a better machine than a, or a good machine than a bad human, I was wondering if you could talk about something I find stakeholders and CEOs still fascinated with, um, which is the term he uses, monkey butt user. <laughs> So people who use out-of-domain language and building bots that respond and have these Easter eggs. And a lot of people get fascinated by uh, if your weather bot can also talk about um, something that is completely tangential to weather and how we should think about that as bot designers and builders. Yeah, good question. Um, so in that book, um, Bruce talks about monkey butt users. I don't know where he came up with that term, but it's basically all the people that try to have, like, you know, Robert will talk about it, all the people that try to have sex with your bot, all the people that want to ask your bot weird weather questions or joke questions. Um, what I think doesn't exist yet, it's really mystifying to me that it doesn't, this is something, where, you know, is going to be built into Automat as well, is... Uh, a notion to have top reusable topics like why is why is for example the vocabulary for people who try to troll your bot with hate speech not a solved problem why doesn't that exist for all of us it's not really competitive you know I'll give you guys access to that we have a really great trolling model right I just don't have a forum yet because Automat isn't live to give you access to all of that so these monkey butt user questions these things that we have to spend time on to build good bots should be solved problems. And I think the way we solved it is as a community, having a place where people can build these models. If somebody needs a model for trolling, if somebody needs a model for jokes, all that kind of stuff, that it's just available and you can grab it off the shelf and then go solve the business problem you're trying to solve. Anyone else? Right behind me. Thanks, uh, it was a great speech, I really appreciated it. 
I'll acknowledge it. I was just wondering, because you were showing the nuance example, and then I wanted to know what were your thoughts on, I think it's Viv by the makers of, or the lab that helped design Siri. And then I think what they were kind of trying to do is, uh, a lot of other people alluded to, but the kind of bot to bot communication, the you know, narrow to, or sorry, the horizontal to the vertical yeah. connection. So what are your thoughts on that? Um, I haven't seen Viv live, so I don't really want to opine on it. I've seen the same demos that you guys have seen. The one thing I will say, um, the tech looks really awesome. Um, I was a little bit surprised, though, to see the demo be so focused on connecting these really complicated questions, right? So you saw in the demo from four years ago at the product launch, pay the statement balance on my Comcast bill for my checking account for this Friday. The reality is zero people do that and zero people learn how to do that. And so solving a problem of creating super long, complicated utterances and plucking out intents and entities out of it doesn't feel like uh, it's solving a huge problem. The tech looks amazing. I think, you know, they, uh, what I just talked about, having reusable components, I think they're well on their way. It seems that they're well on their way to that, going down that path. None of us would be here, I think, without what that team did with Siri. So I think, you know, uh, I expect it'll probably be a really great product, but I don't, I don't know a lot about it uh, outside of the fact that the long utterance stuff isn't something that people do in real life. Give Andy a round of applause. That was really, Thank you guys. really good. <laughs>